Good evening. My name's Lee Pennington, and I'm one of the public programmers for Folks and Triennial. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Plot in the Clearing for a very special event, which is Dan Atkinson's Art Lecture and Strip Tease. <laughs> it's taking a slightly different format tonight. There will be no Q&A at the end, so we're inviting you to sit back, relax, and be entertained. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Dan Atkinson, Art Lecture and Strip Tease. My name is Dan Atkinson. <laughs> I'd like to start by saying I don't think it's possible to overstate what an absolute privilege it is for you to be here this evening. <laughs> there are very few people in the history of mankind who have ever witnessed the perfect fusion of art criticism and hot flesh. <laughs> I intend this evening to tickle your intellect and my undercarriage. <laughs> I don't know what gargantuan sum they've asked of you to be here this evening. I don't want to know. But what I guarantee is it will be worth every penny of your hard-earned money. I've been asked here this evening to give you a little bit of what's in here. Obviously, not too much, only a little for reasons of safety. Uh, any more than that would be too dangerous. Your mind simply couldn't cope. It would be like staring directly into the face of God. <laughs> You'd spend the rest of your life trying to regain your sanity, and I can't have that on my conscience. So let me begin by setting out how this evening is going to work. Firstly, we will have a bit of a uh, history of art in Folkestone. Then we'll move on to the review of this year's festival. And thirdly, I will slowly and deliberately <laughs> remove my clothes. <laughs> I think it's worth, uh, worth pointing out that uh, what this evening is. This evening is the highlight in a series of lectures that have been commissioned uh, to reflect directly and specifically about Folkestone's Art Festival. I don't know if all of you were aware of that. If you're here under some other auspices or you haven't done sufficient homework about the Art Festival, there will be large parts of this evening that are utterly impenetrable to you and that is not on me, that is on you. <laughs> but, 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 but. You have not come here to be berated. You have come here to listen to the authority on Folkestone and art lay it all out for you. <laughs> so let's begin with a little bit of history. This is the 77th annual Triennial, which has happened <laughs> every two years in Folkestone since it was founded in 54 AD by St. Ainsworth and William Harvey. Like the stains on the rim of my commode, the art festival has endured. <laughs> Other local art festivals have come and gone. The plague saw the end to the Dover Biennale. <laughs> the Second World War saw the end of the Dimchurch Quadrennial. And a bad case of radiation sickness saw the end to the new Romney Big Arty Fun Bus. <laughs> but there is something special about our Triennale. It is, it is a wonderful thing, and every few years, public art will spring up around the town with both the regularity and intensity of my herpes, <laughs> often appearing in unusual places, and sometimes it's blistering. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a treat to watch the residents of Folkestone in the days leading up to the Treaniale, walking around town trying to work out what is a new artwork and what is simply fly-tipping. Is it a profound comment on how we live, or just a mattress and a broken printer? <laughs> Is it a commemoration of the pent stream, or just a bollard covered in piss? <laughs> Only time and the Delhi Telegraph art pages will tell. <laughs> Personally, this is my 44th annual Trienniale, and my goodness, there have been so many highlights down the years. Crumbs. Who can forget 
when Ogden Bullrush filled the grand burst in with a thousand angry gibbons. <laughs> that was so moving. Or, or the haunting sound of Viktor Vuvuzelovich standing on the harbour arm, shouting, Ferry! at the times when the ferry would have departed for Boulogne. <laughs> and of course, my goodness, who could forget the jewel in Folkestone's crown, possibly everyone's favourite artwork, <laughs> Bouverie Place. <laughs> we also have an Anthony Gormley statue, which means that there are now three towns left in Britain without one. <laughs> Gormley, truly the Japanese knotweed of contemporary art. <laughs> More recently, there's been a trend within Folkestone and its triennialé to use the artworks to improve the community in practical ways. I mean, just the other side of that wall is Payers Park, which was originally an artwork that then one day miraculously somehow transformed into a park. <laughs> I know. This year, that practice reached its logical conclusion when the Trienniale decided to use visitors as human guinea pigs. They placed artworks in the middle of the gasworks site to determine whether it was safe for the council to build flats on <laughs> or fatally contaminated. Oh, the twin pleasures of huffing in artwork and asbestos. <laughs> so, we, uh, we, what do we come to next? Yes, the town. The town, the artworks are one thing, but what the Trianiali has brought to our town is truly incredible. People have been moving from London to Folkestone like shit to a fly. <laughs> I mean, whether it's the pull of the artworks or their desire to open a cafe that's only open from midday on Fridays and Saturdays, <laughs> that's not for me to say. But the changes are coming. Osteopaths. Homeopaths, psychopaths, <laughs> cappuccinos, baby chinos, men in chinos. It's becoming a middle class bingo. But, uh, but where, do we, where do we go next, Matthew? What about you? Me, yes. This is all well and good. But some of you will be thinking, I like the, guy, the cut of this guy's jib. But is he the real deal? I think it's only fair that, for those of you who are still wondering, that I explain a little bit about myself and my credentials to be here in front of you. I was born <laughs> in the 1970s. Only child to a male sex worker and a female sex worker after a diary mix-up. I was named Daniel after my mother. There was a brief but violent custody battle uh, which my father lost, so I went to live with him. <laughs> my father was a complicated man. I remember, as a five-year-old, he marched me around the Trienniali, forcing me to review the artworks at gunpoint to earn his love. <laughs> I failed. Ah, I could see in his eyes how desperately he wanted to pull the trigger, but for some reason he showed mercy and sent me away to live in a nunnery. The nuns were kind to me. They taught me all the basics, fraud, international money laundering, and the importance of climbing every mountain. <laughs> Upon reaching maturity, I left the nunnery and uh, spent my adolescence in a Venezuelan prison. Who, who didn't? Uh, where I was taken under the wing of an old art historian slash cocaine mule who taught me everything he knew, leaving me with a complete mastery of uh, art criticism and a sphincter like a windsock. As an adult, I then swam back to Britain, where I took my rightful place at the head of the Guild of the Worshipful Art Critics. <laughs> and let's just say, when it came to art criticism, I tore up the rule book. That proved to be an error. It was their only copy. And um, I spent the first six months sellotaping it back together. But what a time it was. Dinners with heads of state traveled internationally, cast in bronze. I even had one of my reviews tattooed on the breast of a fan against his will. <laughs> but when you reach that level, 
my God, you make some enemies. And I made my enemies. And they come for you and they came for me. They started trying to discredit my work, saying things like, I was a joke. And that, that, that you could get more insight out of a child. A child! It still hurts! I wanted to push back, but obviously I panicked and I pushed too hard and everything just came crashing down around me on that fateful evening at the British Library when, when, when... uh. (laughs) After that, I was finished. I just couldn't work anymore. I found myself just wandering around Folkestone's docks trying to offer art criticism for spare fish heads, often going hungry because the fishermen were less interested in critical theory and more interested in fellatio. <laughs> it, takes a, it takes a really brave organisation to give an old dog a second chance. They said I was done for. An alcoholic, a washed up show pony whose only remaining talent was sucking off sailors. <laughs> but creative Folkestone saw through that. <laughs> These angels saw beyond that. And they picked me up, wiped the stains off my crotch, and pushed me back out into the stage. And it is thanks to them that I've been given this opportunity. And it is for them that I will deliver. Let's do this! They said yes. Everyone said no. No, they... I, we, been, we went through this before. I know it was vague uh, when we... Sorry about this. Um, I realise this isn't exactly how you wanted this evening to go. Uh, and I know there's a lot of you here who came specifically for this. I can see this gentleman here, the look in his eyes of disappointment. I, look, OK, I've spent the day going backwards and forwards with this. The venue have their rules. I have my desires. And you just have to try and meet in the middle. I thought we'd met in the middle, but clearly we didn't. We... But the long and the short of it was, my opinion was, it is there in blue and uh, blue, and and that constitutes false advertising if we weren't to do it. I thought it would create a rousing sense of community, but their view was it would create a, what was the word? Tidal wave of vomit. (laughs) And that is hurtful and unfair, because I am a professional. Uh, And how did they... Where's that come from? They, they, we all got Google. They, they, they did just tap, tap, tap. Oh, this guy's coming. Let's find out what we can. And they dredge up one review from decades ago that mentions in passing I have repulsive nipples. <laughs> and, then, and then you make a whole decision based on that. But actually, if you read the rest of the review, they've just been selective with their quoting. There's an enormous amount. I brought it with me. Look, there's loads of beautiful quotes in here. Look, um, uh, 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 Breathtakingly good. There you go. And then um, we, we couldn't tear ourselves away. Um, and then they come into some lovely description of profound. They said it was overpowering and it was moving. And, and what, what did they end with? A lovely phrase. We wanted more. <laughs> it's all there in black and white. But fine, fine. I see you have your rules. We'll just have to move on and do the review of this year's Triennale. Fine. Okay. And I apologise to you. Not for my behaviour, for their behaviour. So, to this year's review, this year's Trianiani. What I was asked to do was to make this evening a little bit special. And rather than just give you a full review, to give you a peek behind the curtain of high-end art criticism. Uh, to give away, maybe, foolishly, a few of the tricks of the trade. So for anyone who really wants to get into this sort of thing, there's a few things that you learn after many decades in the trade to do. So what you will tend to do is find an artwork, and then you look at it, and you think uh, things, and, and then you write them down and communicate those things to other... But <laughs> I've already said too much. <laughs> so for this year's Triennale, I needed to find a day when I was free to go around the artworks and think my thoughts and write them down. And it wasn't easy to find a day because I'm 
fighting a, a lengthy legal battle with the British Library over a striptease that, that didn't quite um, work out. Anyway, that's beside the point. I found a day that worked. Everything was in place, and I was ready to deliver for you people who've come this evening. And then disaster struck. I suffered an indignity that no human being should ever have to endure. My childcare fell through. <laughs> and obviously, this mattered a lot to me. I didn't want to just back out, so I contacted other people. I went through my whole Rolodex of people I might want to talk to, but the, the kind of circles I mix in, they're busy doing things like golfing with celebrities or, 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 or visiting dignitaries. And so, in the end, I couldn't find anyone who would do the job. And, and to be honest, this was just typical. What bad luck. I, I, folks, I don't mind telling you, I have successfully managed to keep at arm's length from this child for the entire five years of the start of his life. And then, and then there he is, on the most important day of my life, sat in front of me, clutching a biscuit and asking me irritating questions like, can I have a drink? And what's your name? And, <laughs> and, so, and, and so I was in a bit of a bind. Most people at this point would give up but not me. I, I, I would like to refer you to Atkinson's five life rules. We'll start with rule number one. Not all of these are relevant to my situation. Rule number one, don't order the big starter or you won't have room for the cheese. That is vital. <laughs> you don't want to get into that situation. You know how good cheese is. Number two, keep your toothpaste and piles cream in different cupboards. That is vital. <laughs> but what I would say is that my piles are minty fresh. Um, <laughs> number three, live every day as if it's your first. Uh, number four, if in doubt, remove your clothes. I think that's a given. And number five, don't let childcare issues stand in the way of delivering a speech you've promised to give in an English coastal town. <laughs> so, going by life rule number five, I decided that I could probably turn this nightmare into an opportunity. A chance to prove my critics wrong. I'm a joke, am I? You get more insight from a child, can you? Well, let's find out, shall we? <laughs> so rather than abandon it at a bus stop or a zoo, <laughs> I decided to walk it around the triennial A and forced it to review the artworks one by one. Here, here is a picture of the child there, walking around doing the reviewing. That's enough, that's enough. I can't look at it anymore. <laughs> and I'm going to put this in your hands, right? You can choose. I'm going to show you the reviews that the five-year-old has created of the artworks of Folkestone from this year. <laughs> if you can honestly hand on heart claim that you have gained any insight whatsoever at the end of it, then this will be the final trienniali I ever review. Guaranteed. Man of his word. Actually, sod it. Let's up the stakes. Forget insight, right? If from the blatherings that he's created, you can even identify more than half of the artworks that we're talking about, then I will not only stop reviewing, but I will also invite the child back into my life with all of its biscuits, and I will parent it right up to the point where it can take my place as an alcoholic and legendary art critic and lover. And, and that is a pledge, right? This is in your hands. If you don't manage to identify more than half of the artworks from his descriptions, then the child is no longer my problem. <laughs> so, let's, uh, let's bring up the first slide, please. Okay. So this is the first review that he came up with. Let's bring up the first. There will be three clues, so to speak, for each one. First one, please. It looks scary and I like it. Insight. Number two, he's got a bum. And number three, his bum smells. <laughs> Just by way of cheer, does anyone here actually work for the Trianiale? Yeah. Uh, well, it'll be especially great when you get this all wrong. Um, genuinely, this is interactive. You are going to try and guess what these are. Oh. What artwork is that from the current Trianiale? What did you say? The Argonaut. Let's see what it is. Bugger! Yeah. Fuck! 
Okay, let's move on to the next one. Let's see it. Let's have the first, uh, first description there. The men are dancing because it makes people happy. Oh, yes. Easy. Next one. The picture is big so everyone can see it. I mean, this, this is just... Uh, and the third one. The men are wearing red with bow ties. Bow ties. Let's have a look and see what it is. Ah. Whose side are you on? Let's, let's have the next clue, please. It looks like clothes. Next. It's horrible. Next. It's the worst one. Does anyone want to? This is not doctored in any way. These are genuine reviews. I, I, I mean, you take it up with him. What's, what's that? Excuse me? The blue clothes one. Let's see it. See if the, is this the one you mean? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. It's going extraordinarily badly. Uh, let's have the next one then. You can walk on the wood. Next. It's nicer than the blue splodges. <laughs> and let's have the last one. It's about a bag of seagulls. <laughs> bag of seagulls. Bag of seagulls. Oh my God. Right, let's have the next one. I mean, I really need all of these now. It was made by an angry man. There's a camera on top. Oh, and a massive gun. Petrol head car. I'm going to need an actual name for this one. Climate emergency, is it? Let's see what it's actually called. Did you say services? You didn't say services. I'm having that one. Death! One for death! Kill him! Kill him! Come on. OK, here you go. This one, it's blue. It's for children and grown-ups. It's kicking people in the shins and punching people in the face. I think it's only fair to tell you it's not blue. <laughs> so you're welcome to... Uh... Yeah, not so clever now, are you? <laughs> Death! Right, let's move on to the next one. It's a boring old tent. <laughs> Next. It was pink, but it should have been green. Next. It's for children, but boring for grown-ups. Oh, and see, what is it? Fortune here. Oh, shit. Shit, shit, shit. All right, let's... This one's double or quits. It looks knobbly, but it doesn't feel knobbly. <laughs> it's the best artwork to sit on. You can do this to it, and, and that is my fault because I wasn't paying attention, so I don't know what he was doing <laughs> when he said that. That is, that is on me. <laughs> it's the best artwork to sit on. It looks knobbly, but it doesn't feel knobbly. Mariko. Mariko Hori. What was that? Seagulls at the back. Yeah. Seagulls, the one we've already had. <laughs> I'm having an extra one for that. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my, my brush, my rules. <laughs> Mariko. Oh, no. Whoa, 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 hang on, there's a disagreement. Yeah, that is for me. <laughs> right. You, you said that one. No, you've had two for that one. No, no, one was for the, the, for the idiot at the back that said seagulls. <laughs> you cannot do that. Uh, that's not acceptable in this room. Let's have the next one. Oh, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is... This is Charles Eddington from Swindon. Charles um, likes fruit salad. He likes his wife's fruit salad. Uh, he wanted her to make it. So one day he got up early and went to the supermarket to buy the ingredients. It was too early for Charles. And um, he uh, accidentally put the pineapple he was buying upside down in his trolley. That's just a silly mistake. What Charles didn't realise is that this is code within the swinging fraternity <laughs> that you are available for business. What Charles also didn't know 
was that his neighbour, Tony, a prominent member <laughs> of the local Swindon dogging and swinging fraternity, was in the aisle next door. Tony saw the sign, misread it, as you would, and proposed to Charles that uh, he and his neighbours all get together as four and do something exciting. <laughs> Charles realised he had been living his life in second gear and did want more excitement. And so he immediately went home and proposed to his wife that they sleep with Tony and Angela from next door. <laughs> she was immediately and quite rightly outraged at the suggestion. And she threw him out. He tried everything. He tried begging, pleading, cajoling. He even offered to pay for that round-the-world cruise she'd always wanted. But none of it was any good. He'd crossed the Rubicon and she wouldn't let him back into her life. Charles uh, went into a bit of a spiral then, sadly, started drinking heavily and uh, eventually lost his job because of the drinking and then ended up living out of a sleeping bag on the streets. He didn't really see a future for himself, so one day he got into his car, a little bit drunk actually, and um, drove down the M4 from Swindon to Bristol Parkway Station where he threw himself onto the train tracks, immediately killing him. This caused havoc with the train timetables. It delayed many trains and cancelled other trains, one of which was supposed to be bringing my childcare to Folkestone so that I could give you the speech that I thought you deserved. <laughs> Clearly, I was wrong. So, seeing as they won't let me get out my balls, I thought <laughs> we've gained ourselves a good three and a half hours. And... <laughs> I feel it's only fair that because you've helped me reconnect with my family, thank you, thank you, it's only fair that I give you something of myself back in return. So let me tell you people here tonight, what's wrong with people who come to things like this? <laughs> let me tell you, art fans, what's wrong with your precious art? If art has a purpose, it is to show you something new or show you something familiar in a new way, to give you a new perspective on life, put that another way, to show you the world through the eyes of someone else. The problem with that is, those eyes are always, inescapably, necessarily, the eyes of an artist. The least stable, most demented eyes available on the planet. And I don't think that's up for debate, is it? Picasso was a misogynist. Degas was an anti-Semite, Manet was in a syphilitic love triangle, Caravaggio killed a man over a game of tennis, but he was Italian, so you've got to make some concessions. <laughs> Gauguin was an STD factory, Eric Gill shagged dogs, and the less said about Barbara Hepworth's child cannibalism, the better. <laughs> it's not just the famous ones, is it? It's all of them. Anyone who's ever had to sit next to an artist at a wedding knows exactly what I'm talking about banging on about universal truths and creative struggles. This is all well and good, mate, but my lamb shank's getting cold. <laughs> oh, what's that? You're not having the lamb shank. You've got a special menu because of your allergies. <laughs> oh, what's that? You're still banging on about yourself. I mean, you don't even know my name yet, but do tell me more about your creative struggles. <laughs> oh, oh, you're celiac as well. Of course you are. <laughs> well, let's get this bread off the table before you shit yourself actually as well as metaphorically. What a way to live your life. See the world through those eyes? No, thank you. Getting up sometimes as early as 11 o'clock in the morning, having a quick flap about the futility of existence, then dragging yourself to the kitchen to have some dry porridge. Not because you have to, but because croissants are decadent. <laughs> then spend most of the day browsing Instagrams of people who are more successful than you are, just to top up your paranoia, and making a couple of marks on a canvas and then declaring yourself creatively exhausted. They're nearly as bad as actors, but I haven't got time to go into that now. <laughs> Public art festivals like this don't help, do they? Normal people just walking around in the streets, minding their own business, suddenly wham! You're inside the mind of a self-pitying artist. <laughs> Unacceptable. I don't want this to come across like a rant. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be all problems and no solutions because it is not all bad. That, uh, there is an answer to this, uh, and thankfully there are a group of people who have dedicated their lives to saving us of the pain of looking at art, and they are private art collectors. <laughs> Safely taking that art and putting it behind closed doors where it cannot hurt us anymore. 
I mean, call me an idealist, but I see a future where all the art is behind closed doors. Barbed wire fences, attack dogs. I mean, people will try and look at it, of course they will, but you know, some rogue aesthete might try and scale the walls, shred their arms on the razor wire, but they won't succeed. And what they don't realize is that they are being torn to bits by the dogs as an act of mercy. A moment in the jaws of an Alsatian is nothing compared to a lifetime of existential angst of looking through the world through an artist's eyes. <laughs> you say it's impossible. I say, why can't we start small? Is there a reason why everyone in here can't go out tomorrow, buy a piece of art, and burn it? <laughs> Who's with me? <laughs> That's not good enough. You've already ruined this evening. You were supposed to just sit there quietly listening to my wisdom, but you've condemned me to a lifetime with a biscuit-obsessed parasite. <laughs> All right. Do you know what? Fuck it. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. Oh, come on! Hopefully it's on. Maybe I'm on yet. No. Thank you very much for coming this evening, and we hope that you learnt a lot. And that you've enjoyed yourself. So that was number five in a series of seven. So we have two more talks left. They will be slightly different to this. <laughs> I promise. Um, the bar is open if you want to carry on um, talking to each other. We'll encourage that. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for coming. I think Dan will also kneel around the bar if you wanted to talk to the panel. Thank you very much.